we uh, just thankful and blessed for our new worship pastors, Chandler and Sarah Groover? Come on, come on, amazing. Hey, turn me to Matthew chapter six. And as you're turning there, um, I, I mean, I, I, I love uh, the certain book and it's actually a book that uh, I, I started reading when I was a child. And my favorite book is actually a children's book. It was actually the first book that my wife and I ever bought when our daughter was born. And then when Ivy was born, we bought her the same book. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna be all religious. It wasn't the Bible, you know. I know some, I saw some people thinking that already. Oh, they, they bought him a kid's Bible. I love the Bible. Uh, but, but, but this book is called The Giving Tree. Anybody ever read the book, The Giving Tree? Come on, it's, it's a beautiful book. And if you've never read it, um, I, I think it's, it, it's got wisdom beyond just for children, but uh, the, the book kind of has these two main characters, apple tree and boy. And, and these two characters have a very fond uh, uh, relationship together. Boy, as a child, swings from the tree of the branches, uh, eats the apples from the tree, enjoys the shade the tree provides. And tree and boy, they deeply love one another. And as the book goes... Uh, as the boy begins to grow up, he begins to make some requests from the tree. And after entering adolescence, the boy, uh, like any teenager, wants some money. And so uh, he's talking to tree and he says, man, I wish I had some money so I go buy some stuff. And tree says, well, hey, why don't you pick all of my apples, take the apples you pick, take them to the marketplace and sell them so that you can have some money, which the boy does. The boy gets married, and uh, once he gets married, he says, man, I really wish I had a house for my wife and the family that we want to start having. Well, the tree's there, and tree says, well, hey, why don't you take all of my branches, cut them off, and then use my branches to build yourself a house, which the boy does. Next, the, the boy's got children of his own and, and uh, his wife and, and, and he's, he's on into his years. And uh, like any good man, he says, you know what I want now? I really wish I had a boat. And uh, he says, I want a boat. And Tree says, well, hey, why don't you take my trunk and chop it off and then use my tree trunk to carve a boat out of it, which boy does. Now, in the final pages of the book, the book shows Boy, and it describes him, it says, now as a shriveled old man, Boy comes to tree that is now just a stump. And Boy is there, and he says, man, I just really wish I had a place to sit and rest. And the ends like this, the story ends with the sentence, and tree said, well, why don't you sit and rest right here on this old stump? And it ends with this sentence, and the tree was happy. See, I love this story because it displays this idea that whatever you have a heart for, you're willing to give to. And tree had exhausted itself to the point of its own detriment that it just wanted to please God boy, because it had a heart for boy. Now we pick up here in Matthew chapter six, and, and Jesus is saying this in Matthew chapter six, verses 19. We're going to start reading there. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break into steel. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Can we pray? Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to come and to partake of your word. Lord, I pray today, Lord, that our hearts will be open, our minds will be open to receive what it is that you're wanting to teach us and instruct us in today. Lord, we submit our lives under the authority of the word of God and under the authority of your spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. 
So we're in week two of our sermon series called Heart. And uh, when Pastor was, was divvying out uh, what I was going to preach for the sermon series, he said, hey, I want you to preach on having a generous heart. And I want you to preach on specifically a heart to give. And I want to be honest, I naturally, my mind naturally went to what everybody else's mind goes to when we say the word giving. When we say the word giving, we automatically think of money, we think of finances, we think of our bank account. Uh, is it just me? No, right? we, we think of giving. We think of money, but I, I want us to understand this, that, that, that giving uh, is so much more than money. Giving is so much more than finances. And, and, and what we like to do is classify giving as money and finances so that then we can separate the idea of giving from the gospel. But I want you to understand this thing, that giving is central to the gospel, that, that, that you cannot have the gospel and escape the idea of giving. Right. See, we have a life because God gave. Right. We have freedom because God gave. Right. We have hope. Why? Because what? God gave gave. That the whole idea that we can have salvation and redemption is based on this idea of giving. That giving is so much more than just what I have in the bank account and the 10% I give in tithe and the offering I give or the missions pledge I give. But giving is actually a lifestyle that God uh, uh, embodied that he invites us into. Because giving is central to the gospel. What's that most infamous scripture? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that what? He gave his only begotten son. See, if you can read the scriptures uh, and read the gospel and say uh, th that God doesn't require me to live a generous and a giving life, you are a much better um, uh, theologian than I am because when I read the scripture, it is all based around this idea that God gave. That because God gave, our life has changed. Is there anybody in here today that's just thankful that God gave? That, that, that we're just thankful that, that God didn't, didn't say, you know, everything looks good up here in heaven and they just got to figure it out down there. No, that God saw us, saw our sin, and then he gave not only of himself, but he gave his only son. So I want to say it like this, a little tongue-in-cheek, uh, but I want to say it like this. If God didn't give, we don't live. But since God gave, we are saved. See, if God didn't give, we don't live. But if God, but if, 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 but since God gave, we are saved. That giving is central to the message of the gospel. I want to submit to you this morning that if we misunderstand giving, we misunderstand the gospel. Right. Let me also say it like this. Where there are perversions on giving, there's also a perversion on the gospel. That where there's extremes of people that, 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 have, that, that neglect this idea of living a life that's giving have perverted the gospel. But the other extreme, that when giving becomes just so what I can get, and it's just name it, claim it. I saw that Ferrari driving down the street. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim that Ferrari for myself. That that is also a perversion of the gospel. And when we misunderstand giving, it, ref it will eventually make its way into misunderstanding the gospel. Yeah. But I think, honestly, sometimes we like misunderstanding giving and misunderstanding the gospel. Because when we misunderstand giving and we misunderstand the gospel, I want to be honest, there's a lot less required from me and a lot less required from my life. Perhaps we don't want to fully understand the gospel because it would affect our lives too much. Because it would affect maybe our pocketbook a little too much. Why? Because the gospel demands something from me. 
See, God gave, and then in return, he views that we are meant to not only receive this gift, but to offer ourselves back to him. Amen. See, giving is, is, is not just about accepting the Lord. It's about giving our lives back to him. See, I, I, I love, um, uh, uh, maybe, uh, I, I love how we've been able to articulate the gospel message so simple, but I want you to know the gospel is very clear, but it's not actually so simple because it requires a lot from us. And listen, I believe and I affirm it. A, B, C of salvation, you, you admit you're a sinner, you believe, and you confess with your mouth. He's faithful. And you do this A, B, C. And what we've done is we have simplified the message of the gospel, but yet we've made it all about just accepting and receiving and not actually about giving away right back to God. But that Jesus, God, God, and God, Jesus is God, left heaven's throne, became incarnate, is also God's son in the Trinity, and, and modeled for us a life to live. And he modeled for us a life that gave away. And God desires the same for us. The gospel actually demands a life change. But I, I, I think it's unfortunate that many Christians in America, and I really do believe this is a generic American problem, many Christians in America see the gospel as a get out of jail free card. That I'm going to go to an altar, I'm going to accept, or I'm going to admit, I'm going to believe, I'm going to confess, and then I'm good. That the gospel really only affects eternity, and it doesn't affect my life now, and something that doesn't affect our life now, well then what do I have to do to follow it? I'm good. I got to get out of hell free card. But I'm just going to be honest, the gospel is so much more than a get out of hell free card. Like, I'm thankful for salvation from eternal torment and eternal damnation. But the gospel is so much more than just that. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. Amen. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. From who? From God. That God gave a gift. He's a given God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things. Notice this, why are we saved? So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. See, the gospel is so much more than your get out of jail or get out of jail free card or get out of hell free card. The gospel and the grace that comes from the gospel is not just grace that saves us from our sin, but it's grace that empowers us to do the good things that God has called us to right now. But we like misunderstanding the gospel because when we misunderstand the gospel, it requires nothing from me. It requires no, no response. I can just go to an altar and I can just say a prayer and then I can go right back out and keep living the same sinful life, keep, keep beating my wife, keep talking bad, keep living like the devil, but I'm good for eternity because the gospel that was presented never actually affects our life. It's a perversion of the gospel. It's a perversion of the gospel. That's how you have a society that is Christian, yet Sunday mornings are the most segregated hour in the, in, in the whole country. It's how you can have a, a, a society of Christians, but also say, yeah, Buddha's the way to heaven. You know, as long as you just got like this idea, you just got, no, like we, we've got to stop cheapening yeah. up the gospel. You see, we have cheapened the gospel to cheapen our response to the gospel. Why have we cheapened the gospel? Because a cheap gospel re requires no response on behalf of the believer. That, that, that it actually requires no response to the gospel. 
We've packaged a gospel that requires no change. We've packaged the gospel as something that has no effect on our earthly lives and is just a get out of hell free card. Therefore, since this version of the gospel does not affect my life, it doesn't demand anything from my life. We've made it so easy for people just to accept Jesus. Whereas Jesus says, you got to pick up your cross and follow me. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? And as the story progresses, Jesus ends with this statement and says, sell everything you have and come follow me. And the rich young ruler leaves with his head down, disappointed. Because he knew it would require a lot from him. Now listen, uh, I'm gonna say something and I'm probably gonna use this method, right? When we end service, so, uh, or, or towards the end of the altar time. But we've made it so easy for people to accept Jesus that, hey, just close your eyes, bow your heads right where you are. Nobody's gonna see you give your life to Jesus. We've actually like infiltrated it into our system. Hey, we don't wanna embarrass you for being a Christ follower. You're good, dude. Now I'm probably at the altar call gonna go, Every head bowed, every eye closed. You want to accept Jesus, you lift your hand or say this prayer after me. I believe in the system, but I also understand that the system can have consequences. That we have birthed people that believe the gospel requires nothing from me. It just requires me to sit back and receive. Now, we live in this tension. We are saved only through faith. But I'll, I'm going to get to it in a minute. I'm going to just jump my, my notes. But the salvation is free, but the appropriation of the salvation is expensive. Wow. Receiving it yeah. is free, so but walking it out in your life is going to cost you something. It might cost you some friends. It might cost you your language and your speech. It, I, I don't know what it's going to cost you, but your salvation is going to cost you something because it's costly. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he, he talks about cheap grace and costly grace. He says this, cheap grace is preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Now, he goes on to talk about costly grace. And he says this, that such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. It is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life. And it's grace because it gives a man the only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it's costly because it cost God the life of his son. Ye were bought with a price and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son dear to a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. See, what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. I'm gonna say that again. What has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. It requires a response from our life that the gift of salvation is free, but the appropriation of the gift, walking in the gift is expensive. Salvation is free to receive, but oftentimes is expensive to walk out. There's a reason Jesus said, don't be surprised when people persecute you. Don't be surprised when you lose friends and family. Don't be surprised when your life changes because of the gospel. Because the gospel wasn't cheap for God. And the response of his people was not for the gospel to become cheap for us. You see, the gospel isn't simply about you getting out of hell. I'm thankful. Anybody's thankful you ain't going, you're going to heaven. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. I'm thankful for my soul. Don't misunderstand me this morning. 
The gospel isn't simply about getting you out of hell. The gospel is about God being after your heart. God being after your heart. I've heard it said before, man, why is God like, like so concerned about money? He, he, God, you know, why, why does God require you uh, to give 10%? And my response was, was is, is this in those moments. God doesn't require me to give 10%. God requires my whole life. I wish God only required 10%. Y'all, y'all thought I was going somewhere else with that. I wish God only asked 10% of me. But what we have done is we have compartmentalized what giving is. And then giving is just the 10% that we do and the offering that we do and the missions that we do. That's giving. The rest of my life, the other 90% of my life has nothing to do with giving. But I submit to you today, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your life is going to be about giving. And yeah, you might give 10%. You might give 20. You might, I don't know what you're going to give, but, but we do it with a generous heart. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am going to take a side road here. I didn't do this with 830 Surface, but I'm going to do a little side road. I think if, if the early church was, was thinking through our idea of tithing, they actually might look at it and go, it's kind of weak. Because when I read in Acts about the early church, they didn't give 10%. They viewed their entire lives as giving. They viewed their entire lives. And then we can can enter uh, these moments where we say, man, why is it that the pastor always talks about money so much? I'm just gonna be honest with you. God is not after your money. God's after your heart. But the truth is if, if God's got your money, it's easier for him to get your heart. If God's got your pocketbook, it's easier for him to get your heart. Because I, I, think, I, think, I think there's this invisible string. And uh, when I go like this and it comes out of my pocket, there's a string from my pocketbook, my wallet, straight to my heart. And then when I do this and lift it up, it pulls my heart down. Anybody ever felt that before, right? Like it's like, oh, like it hurts, it hurts, it hurts for real good. Um, for, for some reason, it's my, my string's not only hooked up to my wallet, but it's hooked up to my, my wife's credit card uh, every Saturday morning about 10 a.m. when she says, hey, I'm baby, I'm going to Target. And I'm like, oh, Montana knows what I'm talking about. Come on. Listen, that, 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 there's a string that's connected. And it's like, oh, it hurts. Because giving sometimes hurts. Let's take it beyond money. Man, I really just want a Saturday morning to sit back, watch college game day. Come on. And I just want to sit back on my couch, watch college game day, and enjoy my day in peace. And then on Sunday, they say, hey, from 8 a.m. to noon, we got a food drive on Saturday. And I don't know if I want to give my time because giving requires hurt. Giving requires something from me. See, God is after our heart and our life, but the truth is this, if God has our heart, he will have our money. You see, I actually, my wife and I, uh, just really started in the last year really preparing for retirement. And... um, uh, you know, what we do for retirement, it might be insignificant to you, but for us, it's a significant amount, you know? And so for us, it's significant for this season of our life. And, and uh, so we've been giving it to, to our retirement. But one thing that I have noticed is that once I start putting money into retirement, I, uh, there, there's an app on my phone that each day I pick up and I open, it's called the Stocks app. And I keep on opening the Stocks app and I'm monitoring where the stock market's doing because generally how we it goes, so my, my investment goes, right? Anybody else can feel the pain where you're looking for gains, but it's just been a long season of loss, and you're going, oh, Lord, help us, Lord. There's a lot of amens there. I like it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and we look at it, and we're going, why? Because where my investment is, there my attention is going to be also. 
Let me rephrase it to the biblical language. Where my treasure is, there my heart will be also. Wherever I have placed an investment of money, of time, of resources, I'm going to be paying attention to that place a little more longer. Why? Because where my treasure is, there my attention is going to. Where I put my money, my focus will be. Where I put my finances, it shows where my heart will be. And Jesus said, no one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God. And I like how the New Living, the updated version has it in my notes. It's not on the screens. It says, you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You can't serve God and still be enslaved to money. You see, if you try to serve two masters, you're never going to please either. There's an old proverb uh, that says this, if you chase two rabbits, you'll catch neither. Imagine now a person that's trying to catch two rabbits. How foolish and ridiculous they look trying to catch both of these rabbits that are going every direction. Well, how that person looks ridiculous trying to catch those two rabbits is how ridiculous we look as Christians trying to serve God while being enslaved to money. Because one demands your allegiance. And we've got to be understanding, am am I enslaved to to money? Is this imaginary string that's right here and here. See, God Actually, I've learned in my life, God uses my my giving of money to actually change my heart. There have been seasons where Mackenzie and I, our greatest moments of faith have come from sacrificial giving. Because, because through these moments, I, I've, 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 we, we've had to learn uh, how, to, how to scale back. We've had to learn how to trust God. We've had to learn these moments. And, and God will wants to use our giving to change us. And, and God will use our money to change your heart. And maybe, I, I said this in the first service, but maybe you've been dealing with the same attitude problems and the same anger and the same things for all your life. And you're, I don't know how I'm going to break it. Can I just may, maybe submit to you today that how God desires to do surgery on your heart is often right in your back pocket. Perhaps the greed and the pride is still there because you think everything is still yours. Because we think that, that, well, I earned this, I deserve this. But when we understand the gospel is about receiving the greatest gift of all, but it's also about living a life that models what God's modeled for us. See, the point of this passage is actually less about God being after your money and God being after your heart. Because if God has your heart, he has your money. If God has your heart, he has your language and your speech. If God has your heart, he has your time. If God has your heart, he has everything. So then the question becomes, where's my treasure? Where's my treasure? Jesus said, don't store up treasures on earth where moths eat them, rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy. Thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. So this week, I actually did a little test to see where my treasure is going. And uh, just good financial advice. You you know, you should probably pull up your bank statement once a month and go, where did my money go this month? Because if you don't tell it where to go, it'll just disappear on you. And uh, I I looked up, man, where where did my treasure go this week? And I noticed I've got a lot of treasure in Starbucks and Forest Lake Golf Club. (laughs) I've got a lot of treasure in those two places. In fact, uh, uh, the Davises can attest that a that couple times a week in the mornings, they see me up at Starbucks sitting early and they come in and get their coffee. I'm sitting there working on some schoolwork or a sermon or something like that. And, and I know where their treasure is too. You know, we like treasure in Starbucks. 
<laughs> Listen, I, gotta, I, I, I purchased the brand new renovation of Hole 18 out at Forest Lake all by myself. I should just become a member at West Orange Country Club or something. You know what I mean? Like my, the, the amount I'm investing, you know, uh, uh, but, but I, I've noticed this is that where my money goes is also where, where, where my treasure is. And, and I, I've noticed I've got two things on my heart, coffee and golf. And listen, those are good things. But may the good things never outweigh the eternal things. May my love and my treasures I give to coffee and Forest Lake Golf Club never outweigh what I'm giving to the kingdom of God. I don't want to store treasures on earth. I, mean, I want to store treasures that are eternal. I want, to, I want to give in people's lives. I want, to, I want to be a person of generosity because whatever you have a heart for, you're willing to give See, what defines us as Christians is not what we have and what we keep, but rather what we give away. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to say this appropriately because there's so, I mean, I'm not going to get into a theological debate. Uh, because there's so many nuances and it's tough in a society where you can't, you can't say nuances anymore, right? Because like you post something on social media and then somebody's like, yeah, but you didn't say this. But what about this? It's like, well, yeah, of course that. But, you know, we don't live in a society of nuances anymore. We live in a society where you're on this side, or you're on that side, right? And, and we live in this, this, this non-nuanced society. Um, and, and, uh, See, so, it's, 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 what defines us as Christians is not what we have and what we keep, but rather what we give away. What defines us is not just simply receiving God's grace, but actually walking in God's grace. That we receive God's grace in its grace because only he can give it. We receive God's grace to forgive us, but yet we don't just throw God's grace away, but we choose to say, I'm going to, I'm a sinner and I need God's grace every day to sustain me in my day-to-day -day life. I need God's grace to help me overcome my sinful nature, to help me overcome the attacks of the devil, the attacks of the enemy. And we've, it's not just us receiving it, but it's us walking in it. It's us saying, I, I need this to help me change my life. Let me give you some scriptures uh, to kind of focus on uh, that are really for us. And, and what I love about scripture is you can disagree with what anything that I've said today, and that's okay. My email is pastorgeary at ecoegt.com. <laughs> it's okay. Be sure all your complaints go right there, and that's okay. You send your complaints there, but you can argue with me all day, but you can't argue with scripture. Yeah. I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. <laughs> 1 John 3, 16, 17 says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Since you excel in so many ways in your faith and your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. Now, specifically, contextually, he is talking about money right there. Because he's talking about how there's this poor church that... I believe it was Thessalonica, and I could be wrong, so don't hold me to it, but I believe it was in Thessalonica, and he says they are poor by all of the world's standards, yet in their poverty, they still found a way to give. And they gave with cheerful hearts. Do 
If you were at worship conf- or, uh, if you were at presence conference a couple weeks ago, I, I, I titled my sermon on Friday night, "Where Are the Aunt Christines?" And this idea of, of Aunt Christine may not mean nothing to you, but it means a lot for me. It means there's this woman who was a mother of this church for many years who lived her walk out full of the Holy Ghost and, and just powerful, love the Lord. And the idea was this, is like, man, we have a generation marked by Aunt Christine's, but when we look at the current generation, who are they? Who's gonna mark the next generation? And at her funeral, pastor shared this because in her life, she would never publicize this. And by all worldly standards, Aunt Christine was the poor widow that would bring her little penny and drop it in. Aunt Christine lived over here uh, in Trailer City, over here in Winter Garden. And Aunt Christine... uh, lived on social security. That's all she had, $600 a month. And you, and the sisters, we love, they love to go out to eat. She loved that. But did you know this, and you probably didn't, to this day, Aunt Christine was the biggest percentage giver ever at Glad Tidings. $600 a month that she made but yet lived a life of going, my life isn't my own. I'm just gonna give my life life away. Where are the Aunt Christine? I wanna be an Aunt Christine. First Timothy 6, 17 through 19, Paul is writing to Timothy, a young pastor, and tells him this to tell the people of God, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Now notice this, by doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. And Paul's writing that giving is actually a path in which we can enter into the abundant life that Jesus asked and Jesus promised. Can I encourage you today? Don't store your treasures on earth store them in heaven. Live with your life, not just about living frivolously, but live with intentionality so that it doesn't just affect right now, but it affects eternity. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Lord, this word, I'll be honest, is very... Uh, It was uncomfortable for me to talk about. And Lord, I repent of that because giving is central to the gospel. God, I pray this morning that you give us a heart to give, a heart to give our time, a heart to give our love, a heart to give our money, a heart to give our kindness. Lord, a heart that exhausts ourselves like that old tree. God, thank you that giving so much more than money, that it's a lifestyle that we've been invited into that Jesus displayed for us. It's a lifestyle that's been changed by you first giving. You know, in this room, I just want us to close our eyes all across this room. I want you to imagine your heart as a home. And sometimes our homes can get cluttered, full of stuff. And sometimes we've, in the natural, we bring in a cleaner, but I want you to know the Holy Spirit is here clean out anything in your heart that's become cluttered. 
And maybe it is this idea of giving money, but maybe it's you haven't given him old wounds. I just, as I said that, I just felt that there's someone in here, maybe you're watching online that you have not given God the wounds of past church hurt. See, relationship is about receiving from God what he's given. And it's about us giving to God, knowing that he receives every hurt in our life. So just take a moment, allow the Holy Spirit to search you. Allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Say this after me, say, Holy Spirit, I need you. Search me. I need you. Just allow the Lord to search the caverns of your heart. If he brings something to your attention, just say, Lord, I'm sorry for that. Lord, I don't want to live with an unsurrendered heart. Just as soon as it pops in your mind, just, just repent of it. It's that, it's, that, it's that simple. Lord, we turn from it today. Lord, we want to live a life not marked by what we have and what we keep, but a life marked by what we give away. So, Lord, today we give you our heart. As a sign of us giving our heart to the Lord, can we stand together? And as you stand, can you lift your hands to heaven? And can you just begin to just worship and bless him and just thank him? Just, 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 just thank him that he's given to you. But now let's give our life as an offering right back to him. Lord, we give you our heart. We give you our life. We give you everything, Lord. Lord, we give you our heart and our life, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on and let's just tell him today. Let's surrender to him.